All right, so let's make a formal introduction for our listeners. Uh, good morning, David. My name is Claudio. I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., from the Susan Fairfax City. We're very calm and grateful that David helped and accepted our invitation to our show. Hey, David, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, Claudio. It's nice to, to meet you and be part of your show. And I very recently heard so much about you. And my publicist, Beth, reached out and said that your shows are amazing. So thank you. I'm excited to, uh, to talk with you. Thank you very much. Same here, man. So let, let's start with the, what's going on in the world. You know, this has been a very weird period for everybody uh, with the pandemic. Uh, that is, it is going away. It's not going away. Some people believe in the vaccine. Some people don't. Uh, how the how the COVID has affected you, you, your life, your family, your your life as a musician? Because if you're a touring musician, you cannot earn money. You cannot do. You will stay at home. So how 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 you holding up, man? Well, I'm holding up pretty well. You know, I'm not a touring musician. Um, I'm a recording artist, so I make records and I don't perform live. Um, and the pandemic, you know, I, I think kind of affected me, I assume, as it affected a lot of other people. You know, I, I can be sort of a homebody. Um, I've been fixing up my home for the past 10 years. I've been fixing up my studio. Um, I love, I'm, I'm here in San Diego. I'm in a good place. When the pandemic first happened and everything sort of went very quickly from um, a lot of activity to nothing. You know, the airlines stopped, the freeways were empty, people were staying home. Um, as a, I'm an optimist as a person, and uh, I sort of saw that as, you know, people are staying home, they're cooking for themselves, maybe being closer to their family, and there's less pollution. And I was like, you know, maybe there's going to be something positive out of this. Um, and it just kept going and going and I was waiting. Okay. When, when is the pandemic over? And it, it, it hasn't been a clean on and off. It's been all these different talk and, um, levels, levels of contagion, levels of safety. And now it's still going on. So, um, all I can do is stay inspired and work on music and try to stay healthy. And that's what I'm doing and trying to see the positive in everything. And that's, uh, that. I don't know if you hear it, but in my music, there's a lot of positivity and love and hope in the stuff, even though I'm making epic electronic music, you know? For me, man, it's too bad to say this because over a million people, at least in the United States, have died and the previous administration didn't do anything enough. Well, I don't want to go on for it, but it could, it could have been managed differently, especially in the United States, we have the means of resources to do whatever we want. Other country took the stuff seriously, across the border, put people to work and, you know, took the BS other way, but unfortunately in this country we didn't. So for me, was, I was going too fast in my life, right? I was uh -huh. buying a lot of music, a lot of music, and I was buying more that I was able to consume. So uh, I, you know, I slowed down in my life and I said, well, Music is very important to me, man. I, I better, you know, since I'm working at home, instead of putting the CD or the vinyl, uh, why don't I create a, a record to listen to my own stuff? Yeah, never mind, right? To listen to my own, a, a good interface and uh, play a random with different style, right? And then and then I send the link to different people and uh, they like the stuff. And then it went, you know, step by step. First, I opened like a soft rock radio, then a jazz and rock. Then I began doing interviews and then an electronic music. And then I thought, man, if, if the tour, if musicians are not touring, they must be at home. Has nothing, maybe they have nothing to do. Yeah. So I yeah. ended up sending email at the beginning. Nobody, nobody gave me a, you know, I didn't get any feedback. Nobody was advising, I said, man, what I'm doing wrong. And eventually, a former member of Genesis, Steve Hackett, mm -hmm. replied to me and I say, listen, you know, my my radios are 50 people, you know, nobody knows the radio, but I, I plan to do something good. As mentioned before, my goal is to have a radio for everybody can listen, always going to be free, broadcasting a good quality, no advertising, no social media BS, just good music. And, and it's going to be great. And, and Steve Hackett then say, yeah, no problem, I will give you it. And then another one, and then another one, and, 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 and it had been like, you know, like, a gift, a miracle for me that, you know, now people all over the world listen to stuff. I've been able to interview people from Toto, from Genesis and all the electronic music guys in, in, in Germany and uh, you now. And, uh, it, it, you know, it's been a pleasure, man. I well, cannot 
Look, look where you are. You know, yeah. you, you decided yeah, yeah. to do this and now you have a bunch of radio stations. You've created this really high end format for anyone anywhere to tune into all your stations. And you seem pretty happy. You must have a lot of listeners telling you that they love your service. Absolutely, man. I'm, I'm very, I'm very lucky. As I mentioned before, I don't play any instrument. I don't know how to read any kind of music at all, but I've been listening to music three, four hours a day from the last 50 years. Or so I'm very, very, very blessed, man. I love that. Were you, were you born like in a musical family and how were you when you began perhaps taking piano lessons or, or, guitar um, or I, you know, I'm, I was born and raised here in San Diego, California, yeah. um, you know, a beach, beach culture. Um, and <laughs> my family wasn't necessarily a musical family, um, but there was always a piano in the house and there was a piano in my house. And then I would go over to my grandmother's house often and she had this beautiful piano. So I was always, when the parents are talking, I would run into the piano room and I would hold the pedal down, the sustain pedal, and listen to the notes go long, sustained. And I, I, I found a lot of magic in piano. So I started just plucking out little ideas when I was like six years old. Um, and then by the time I got into uh, middle school or, or high school, when I was maybe 15, I, I was listening to uh, U2, Depeche Mode, Simple Minds, all these big sounds, big guitar sounds, big synthesizers. So I bought a guitar, I, I was in a band, you know, and I was just chasing that big sound and I still am. Um, I just happened to lean into a place that was more spacious and atmospheric, but still really big. Um, and that's, that's the, the path that led me to where I am right now. Before you, were you like in a band before when you- I was in a bunch of bands in high school. You know, we were just messing around doing, writing our own songs, playing U2 songs. Um, and then I would be in another band and then that would break up, you know, in high school, the commitment yeah. level isn't really serious. A lot of the bands I was in, most of the members were interested in uh, getting the girls, uh, and stuff, which is cool. But I, I really was chasing this big guitar sound. So I just kept going to bands and eventually I gave up. I was like, you know what, I'm just going to do music myself because it became clear that I couldn't rely on a drummer and a bass player and a keyboardist all the time. So I said, I'll just play all, all the instruments. So as soon as I graduated high school, I built a very small studio and I started making my own music. I did my own percussion. I got into sampling synthesizers. And ever since then, I've been my own person, you know, and I would just make music that I want to make just for me, my own weird kind of music, you know? Um, and it turns out there's a lot of people that like that. So. And then with, um, Family pressure in the sense of, well, forget about music, go to school, you know, you will never make any money as a musician or I'm quite sure that you had the conversation with your, with your, with your dad, your parents. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I'm, I'm lucky for the most part that my parents uh, trusted me. Yeah. Um, but when I was in high school, I was a senior in high school. I said, mom and dad, I'm not even going to take the SAT because I'm never going to college. And they said, well, why, what are you gonna do? And I said, I wanna be a musician. You imagine your parents saying, you wanna be a musician, really? And, <laughs> um, but they were like, okay, do what you're gonna do. Um, but it, it led me here and um, I've been producing music for television and film and video games since uh, 2000. And I own two publishing companies, one Southern Hemisphere, one here. Um, and I have eight records on a great record label and I make music full time and I have a house. So my parents are like, good yeah, job, yeah. you did it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For me, man, I was a, a, a terrible student, a very bad student and my parents were very pissed off at me because my <laughs> kind of, my dad and my mom were kind of famous in, uh, in Chile and uh, I wasn't applying myself. I was, you know, chasing girls and drinking beer all the time. And, yeah. and I wanted to come to, uh, you know, re remember 36 year, uh, ago, you know, bands were not going to Latin America, right? So I was going crazy because I would have a, 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 a vinyl from Pink Floyd or Led Zeppelin or whatever Genesis and I couldn't see them live. YouTube didn't exist, the internet didn't exist. So I was going crazy, you know, so I, <laughs> and, my, and I wanna, I, so, uh, and I was a very bad student. So my parents said, you know, what makes you feel that will help you out? If, if you don't make it here, your own home, living at home, what makes you feel that you will make it there? And well, 30, 
37 years later from being a, a very bad student, I, I have six college degrees. I went to the best school in the country. Uh, I work for a great company. I'm a software engineer and uh, I own a couple of companies. I'm doing, nice. So I have done well with my life and I cannot complain. I'm not, Congratulations. You know, when people say talk about the American dream, I, I mean, I'm the American dream alive because I, this country has been very, very good to me. People. Um, how old were you when you moved from Chile to to uh, the East Coast? Twenty one. Wow, young twenty one year old into yeah. the United States. Did you did you come directly to the East Coast into Washington D.C.? No, I went to um, I arrived in Chicago. I went to school in in University of I attended engineering school in University of Illinois. Okay. And Urbana Champaign. Then I went to Boston. I went to Harvard. I did a couple of master degrees. Then I got another master at UVA. Now I'm finishing the um, program at, at MIT. So I, 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 I look out. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm an average guy. The, the only difference is that I have more motivation than most people. That so I have like a dinner drive to. I love that to to, to to succeed and do well in life. You know, people right. Right now we were talking before the interview, right? Yeah, I cannot get a hold of Peter Gabriel or. All the other Genesis guy or the Pink Floyd, let's settle in my top three band, but I'm closing the gap little by little. Man. I'm, pretty I'm, soon, I'm, pretty soon they're going to answer the phone because they're going to go, oh, it's, it's Claudio Pusamonte. Yeah. We're let's yeah. let's call this guy. You know, that's right? So I'm 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 very I'm very blessed. So that's well, that's a, yeah. I think that's an inspiring story. Your story is inspiring for me, but it's inspiring for your listeners. Um, yeah. Twenty one years old, you go from Chile to Chicago, and you. You know, and you're in the United States, and now you have all these degrees, and you own all these companies. But through all of that, your enthusiasm for the music that you like, this progressive electronic music, yeah, is still where you are every day, and that's, that's amazing. That's right. That, that's right. I mean, it's uh, it, it, music takes me places. I don't know how to describe. It. I could name it, but, I, but I, you know, if you're at home on. I would listen a good example I was listening to the album in the last one, the latest one you did, and the yeah. videos that you sent me, and uh, and all the stuff in 45. Put my headphone, I drink a couple of beers, and I fly, I go places, you know. It's, yeah. it's amazing, it's amazing. Thank and uh, and uh, I'm very fortunate, you know. The fact that I put this radio to begin with, the fact that people are listening, the fact that I'm talking to you and all the other people I have talked to, and uh. And, and so on so forth. It's it's amazing. It's like a miracle. I've been in this country. Fortunately, I'm so proud to be a U.S. citizen now. But people complain too much, man, about this president, that president, this. That. Man, it, I'm I'm a stupid guy, an average guy who did it. Everybody, <laughs> anybody could do it. Yeah, of course, not everybody will be. You know, uh, will have a bunch of degree or go to an Ivy school. But you can do very well in this country. Don't blame the government, the system. This. I I agree with you. you um, know. I'm. I'm a very average person, you know, my skill is in just making art and making music. And I have little patience for people that complain, um, yeah. especially in a country like this, where you can do absolutely anything you want and be anything you want to be, but it takes a significant amount of effort and work and um, vision. And if you have that, you can do anything. So you're, you're proof of that. I'm Thank proof you. of that. I, how, I did not do well in school. <laughs> yeah, hard work pays off, man. You know it does. Yeah, you know, and I, I just kept going myself, just like making music, making music, making music for television, video games, movies, because I wanted to get closer to to this. And now I've transitioned into really making records full time, and I still do music for media as well. But I'm yeah. spending a lot of time making music. I'm working on a lot of new projects right now. Just I finally you. finished in, which took eight years. I think you may maybe know the story. But now that the big album is out, I am sort of doing a reset and moving forward on a lot of new projects. So it's a it's a very creative and exciting time for me, even though the pandemic is happening outside in here. I have a plan. I'm working very hard. I'm very inspired. So and why it took eight years? I mean, it's a very ambitious. Work. It's an ambitious project. I wanted to make an album just for me, my own kind of music with no regard for what is popular, for no regard. I'm not making it for anyone else, just for me, but I wanted the album, every song to be an anthem. I wanted every song to have so much detail and beauty in it. And I wanted every song to be long. Like one song is a journey. 
Um, and so I set the bar really high and I set it so high. In fact, that I was doing it all by myself that a couple of times I had break a breakdown, a mental breakdown where I was like, ah, it's, this is too much. I had to put the whole project away. And then I released an ambient guitar record, which is very simple, pure music. Then I went back to in and I worked on it some more and did a bunch of work and then got overwhelmed again, put it away again, released another ambient guitar album in 20. 19 which was rune um and then i finally came back and i finished it um but i yeah i know you've just listened to it but this is very complex multi-textural music with a lot of instruments in every track and to release an album that's 90 minutes long that with right. eight minute long songs in instrumental music it's kind of uh not exactly what what is the standard thing for artists right now? So yeah, 90 minutes, unbelievable. I think I never, yeah, I probably never. Of course, in on a vinyl, you couldn't do it, right? But on a CD, you have like 13 or 14 tracks. It's, 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 it's impossible. I mean, it's... Yeah. Well, luckily, the, re the record label I'm signed to, Spotted Peccary Music, um, you know, this is a double CD. So you open it and it's two CDs, disc yeah, one and yeah. disc two. It's in vinyl, which is coming out any day it's about to show up and it's a double vinyl, you know, with two big records with all the color and um, you, to have a double album is really exciting and to have all these people loving it. Cause it's been very well received. And for me, that's Absolutely. what it's all about. Cause um, you know, I worked for eight years putting every ounce of myself into this album so much that I almost had nothing left. Um, but to work that hard for so long, just to give it away. It's kind of an interesting uh, space to be in. Sure, but why? So it would have been very easy for you to give out the project, right? And say, no, I want to do simple stuff. I will get paid the same amount of money that I do this final, that one or that. Why you didn't give up? You know, because it kept on coming back to you. It kept on coming back. Man, no, I, I have I, something I, there. When I had these breakdowns and I put it away, I knew that I was going to finish the record and I never gave up. But I, my vision was a grand vision. I want this big double album where every song is huge and every song is an anthem, but every song is full of emotion. Yep. And it for people can take headphone journeys. And, you know, I really wanted to do that. And I knew I was going to do it. Um, it just took time because I'm one person. I'm still learning. I'm still growing. I have good days and I have bad days. I'm not always on, you know, because I'm, I'm making this from my heart. So I have to be inspired. To, to really bring the best melodies and progressions and sounds and production to every track. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it's exhausting. What's, what's your creative process like? I mean, on a, on a weekly basis, on a day-to-day -day basis? What? Um, my creative process? Yeah, how the music come to you or you do I drive in somewhere and you listen to stuff or you write stuff down? How? how? Um, I'm always inspired and I always have ideas. Um, that's the easy part. Um, I come in here and I, I have many instruments and I play guitar and synthesizers and drums and I do a lot of programming and I create really interesting sounds and I, I have all my special sounds. So when I come in here and I have an idea, sometimes it starts on the piano. I have a electric uh, grand here, the CP70 from the 80s. And then I have a grand piano, Steinway in, in the house. Um, but I'll, I'll start with an idea and Last night I was in the piano room and I was playing something and I, I knew I was going to forget it. So I got my iPhone and I recorded a video of me playing this idea. And I have a bunch of those ideas. And then I'll come in here and take that simple idea and I'll listen to it and say, where does this idea want to go? How big does it want to get? What is after this part? What's part A, B, C, D? And what, what synthesizer sounds do I want? Is it drums or no drums? And I just listen to it and I just keep going when I go until it's a big overwhelming thing with all kinds of stuff in it, then I have to figure out how to make it all beautiful and play nice together to create an arc of an experience for the listener, mm. whether it's eight minutes long or 10 minutes long or six minutes long, it's a, it's a task. So the ideas come easy. I have hundreds of ideas, finishing them in a way that is amazing, takes time and craft. Absolutely. Yeah. By the way, your website, it's I'm a, I'm a software guy, so it's very, very well done, man. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you. Very, very well. Nice put together the picture, the, the video, the image, the text. Thank you. And, uh, the menu of structure. Yeah, it's very, very well done. So. Well, I, I do have to shout out my really good friend, um, Joe Abreu, created the whole website. He's also a photographer. He took all the photos of me. Yeah. And he's done a lot of my music videos. So, yeah. Joe, if you're listening, thank you for being so awesome. And, and thank you for your your thoughts on the website. So that was davidhelpling.com, right? That's right, yeah. It's Thank you. That's amazing. a new website for me. I haven't had a website for years, and I figured with this album, it was time to, to get to put something nice together. Absolutely. Man. So let's Thank go you. back to the, your first record in 96 and 99. Yep. Um, you know, before we talk into that particular record, how difficult was to put these two albums together? Because you were very young, you know, you were playing instruments, saving enough money to buy, you know, a keyboard or, you know, never mind the you know, the equipment that you have right now, but at yeah, the yeah, time, yeah. How, how difficult was to put the two, the first two together? It's been a long time and, and a long journey to where I am now, obviously, both with my, my technical abilities as an engineer, as a composer, but all the equipment and the technology changes daily. You have to stay hip with it. But back in 1996, my first album was called Between Green and Blue. Right, and I yeah. made this album myself. I wasn't on a record label. I didn't even know if people would like this kind of music. And the concept with my first album was to take my ambient guitars, which are delays that are synchronized to tempo, modulation delays, looping, um, and taking that and mixing it with percussion and synthesizers, because that's, that's what I love. So I made the album myself, and I made a bunch of CDs, and I give it away like as a business card. So, and I worked at a music store. So all day long, every day, I was in a music store selling synthesizers and recording gear to all these artists and i would give them the cd and one day these two guys came in and i gave them the cd and these were two guys from the record label and they said hey we want to sign you we love your music we want to take what you've made and remaster it and redo the artwork and sign you and i was like cool let's do that so the first album happened without it ever being a record it was just like i'm having fun let me make a bunch of songs um and the second album that was tough. You know, people talk about their sophomore album. Um, to, for me, when your first album happens almost on accident, and now they're like, okay. Oh, and also that album was nominated for New Age Album of the Year. Totally, so, yeah. And they're like, okay, now that you're signed on a contract, make your second album and make it awesome. There's, there's nothing in the world that has more pressure than, okay, you have an award-winning album, now make a better one. So that that was tough. But in 1999, I released my second album, and that was Sleeping on the Edge of the World. And if you listen to Between Green and Blue from 96 and Sleeping on the Edge of the World in 99, you see a big jump yeah. in production style and synthesizers and, and really dialing in the reverbs and, and finding a magical space. So I grew so much in that first few years between my first and second record. Um, and then from 99 to now, it's been, you know, a slow climb. But yeah, that's how it happened. It, it, it spotted Peccary, that particular record label, specialized in, in uh, you know, introspective soundscape and stuff like that. So, it's, you know, it's good that, you know, you, well, they find you, but, you know, in a way you end up with the right, right the correct record label, which is. Yeah, important. yeah, and they're, they're West Coast people and all of the music and all the artists that they were signing even back then were very much in line with these musical dreams I've always had of, of these sounds and making music that was instrumental, but was going places and inspired people and was really cinematic, kind of. Um, and there were other artists on the label doing that, like John Jenkins, who I ended up collaborating with from 2007 to 2013. We made three albums together. Um, but there's a lot of people on the record label that had the same vision. And the record label, everyone involved, is really focused on the art. Um, and when you think of record labels, you think of money. These guys want to make sure every record looks amazing and sounds amazing, and they want to get it out there and change the world. They really do. And they really are still like that. They don't just sign anybody. They, it has to be really good. Um, so I feel very fortunate that they found me or I found them or however you think about that serendipitous meeting um i think i'm very fortunate to be connected with them and here we are 
2022, I just released my eighth album and it's a double album and I'm working yeah. on more. Yeah. And, yeah. Wow. It's Who would have thought, right? Yeah. I would love to uh, get a hold of the owner of the record label because I'm interested right now. I'm going to be interviewing some famous record engineers. Uh, I'm going to be interviewing the, the head of Abbey Road in London. Wow. Uh, uh, the the guy who does all the mixing and production for Peter Gabriel in London and uh, yeah so I wanna you see I wanna see when I buy a CD or a vinyl what happened I mean the whole the whole process right the, the remastering the this and fixing change and fixing change get a producer I, I I have no idea how this work I tomorrow I'm going to see Sigur Ross I pay a hundred bucks. I yep. go in, take a couple of beer, hopefully talk to them. And, <laughs> and leave. I have no idea how the instrument got there, how the wind is there, how difficult they were. The same. I'm, I'm seeing Coldplay on Wednesday. I want to enjoy myself. And uh, I don't know the, how this stuff happened. It would be I love your I love your passion for all this music. And you just go to these concerts and you connect with these people. Absolutely. But you, you've been doing this radio thing for so long or so well. Yeah, now, you. When, when you would talk to these people, they're like, oh, you're that guy. We need to talk to you. You know. Yeah, so, thank you. Thank but, you. But you're still a fan. I see that in your eyes. You're a fan of this. Oh, music. absolutely. I, I see. Just to give an idea, David, I see between I don't know, thirty-five to fifty, fifty-five shows a year. I am very lucky because I live in the border with. I live in Virginia. But I live in the border with Washington D.C. and Maryland, which is about twenty minutes away. So every band come this way. And I mean, every band come this way because the, the income per capita here is higher, close to Washington DC. They know that every band will come here. They will, you know, they will sell out the, a big uh, show. And so I'm able to see from Pink Floyd people, well, they're not alive. I mean, they're not together, but, but from Genesis, from uh, Coldplay many times, Pat Benatar, Blondie, you know, Kraftwerk, I'm seeing Tear for Three nice. Years. And nice. so, so I'm, I'm very, I'm very, very lucky, you know. And, you, and, you are very lucky. And, and being here in San Diego, every yeah. band comes here as well. And I've seen Pink Floyd live and I've seen U2 live. I've seen Cheers for Fears. I've seen yeah. The Fix. I've seen Simple Minds, oh, Echo and the Bunnymen, Depeche Mode. I've been to all these shows in That's the last brilliant. five years because all these bands are coming through here. Um, so I, I too am very fortunate in a place where even though the live music was shut down for a while, it's definitely back. My whole, this is June and I have a lot of shows I'm going to see. Um, so it's going to be, it's going to be cool. So I share that with you, but um, to go back to what you said, you said you get these, the CD or this record and you don't know everything that went into it. Mm -hmm. And then you get to find out who engineered it, who mastered it, mm -hmm. how it was made, how the instruments are done. Um, and I think that's important for listeners, especially now where the, the paradigm is you go on Spotify and the album is a little square and you listen to it, boom, 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 and you're done. And you don't necessarily have any kind of knowledge of the fact that um, a bunch of people worked really hard for a long time to make this little thing that you're listening to. Yeah. And for me, especially within, you know, eight years, all 90 minutes of music, um, I mixed it myself. I had a lot of musicians. I recorded it myself. I had it mastered by Emily Lazar in New York, who I've wanted to work for for a long time. Um, yeah. So there's a lot that went into this record. So oh, I absolutely. love, absolutely. I love that you go behind it and find out. Wow, what did it take to make this yeah. magic? And I think people need to to know that this yeah. music doesn't just happen. Well, it, it, for me, absolutely. You know, I have many records that I don't know. I have I don't know, like three thousand vinyls. <sighs> 6,000 CDs, about wow. 1,000 Spotify. Blu-ray. I have like four different floors. Here's a part of it, right? You you need so, to do a video tour of your collection and just make a video that's a so, tour. Uh, let me give an example. So let's sure. say, uh, let me pick two albums, right? This is an album from um, Pat Metheny. I don't know. Oh, Pat Metheny. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I love uh, Pat This is a great album, right? Yeah. And of course, Kraftwerk, we mentioned that. Yep. I'm bringing yep. that to my to a friend in 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 uh, when I go to California next week. So, yep, I know they're great. But so my question, since I'm an engineer, right? Why they're great? And other other CDs are not that great. Other bands are not that great. You know. So yeah, the, so the artist is the same. So it was the engineer, the producer. 
uh, you know, wh why make something great? And uh, so I begin now behind the scene. I, I, I'm interviewing with all the people, but I wanna, I wanna see, you know, what's happening behind the scene. What, who, what make a, a, an album or, or, or not great, right? Yeah, in, uh, in a lot of cases. How mixed it's... together? Where was produced? Whether it's a record label was the great? Is the engineer was unbelievable? How, you know, like, like for example, your album in. Yes. It's a very complex album. It's a very complex. It takes many into men and the other vocalists that are, are on different track, different people, and you know, getting a hold of them. Of course, with the COVID, where well, I need to, you know, get a get a hold of Mary, that that's a great voice, or yeah, you know, Suzanne, that can be a great, you know, and then somebody to send the track, put it together, and you like it? No, I don't like it. <laughs> get, get boys to bitch. You know, I think uh, Andreas can be better from this track, but not for that one. That take man and somebody to put it to wear, somebody to be running the show for you, you know. And, years, years. You know, so that, I do it that, all myself. But um, yeah, yeah you, you know, Pat, Pat Metheny, all, all it, all the magic comes from Pat Metheny's fingers. You know, all you have to do is record it, and it's going to be great. Everything he does is great. Um, and he just did a great interview with Rick Beato on his YouTube channel. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, oh, so good. I love Pat Metheny. But yeah, you're right. Um, you know, for me, I did have. I have four different um, session musicians that I had come in to play instruments. Um, but these are people that I already knew that were very excited for the new album and what I was doing, and they really wanted to be part of it. So it wasn't like I was auditioning people. I went to Miriam Stockley, who I'm a huge fan of, and I already knew that she would say yes because we had worked together a little bit in the past. Um, and then Matthew Shaning plays electric cello. Benji Wertheimer plays the Ezrosh, which is a, a bowed Indian instrument. Um, and these are just amazing people, you know, I'm yeah. kind of lucky to, to have them. And then, um, Nidhi Bhatmuli is an Indian singer that is here in San Diego. So she came, we recorded all the vocals right here, um, and had a blast. Took us how three. Do you know, how, do, how do you know those people? I mean, how do you get a. I, I, well, I was connected through Nidhi Bhatmuli because of a, a film score that I did. That was an Indo-American film that I needed some Indian instruments and she's a singer. So I'd already worked with her before and recorded her here. And Matthew Shaning is a is a peer. I had been to some award shows and I saw him perform where I was performing. And I, I saw him play cello through delays and looping. And I was like, ah, I got to work with this guy. So, you know, you start building connections. Um, and Miriam Stockley, I've been a fan since 91, um, like a fan. And eventually over time, I reached out to her. And now I'm at the point where I can call her and she knows who I am. And it's still very surreal for me because to me, Miriam is like, whatever you, you feel the best female vocalist is on the planet, that's Miriam to me. So yeah, it's, it's a dream to be connected with these people now. And it's kind yeah. of dangerous because if I have an idea, I can just call her and say, hey, you want to sing on this? And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's really yeah. fun. For me, for me, from the radio at the beginning, I was sending 20 emails a day, nobody would reply. Now people are getting back. Now people are pinging me, say, hey, I noticed that the interview is for a picker. Yeah, that you did with that guy, that guy, or I yeah. used to play with Tangerine Dream. I did an album in 1985 in Berlin. And yeah, let's, you know, let's make time to do it. And so it's unbelievable, you know. I'm, uh, and now you're connected with all these people. And before you know it, you will be talking to Peter Gabriel. I hope so, man. I hope so. You, yeah. you will be talking to Roger Waters or. Uh, yeah, I hope, I hope it's so. Gonna, it's going to happen. I, I want to interview everybody. I'm a, I'm a very um, ambitious person. I, for me, I, I, I to give up. I'm an immigrant, as you know, right? So yeah. I, 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 my inside, the way that my brain works or whatever, it's it. I'm, I'm perseverant. I'm consistent. You know, and, you know, un, unless you know, Peter Gabriel end up suing me because I sent him to him many emails <laughs> and I will stop. <laughs> But 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 uh, but I wanna I wanna interview everybody for 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 the radio for YouTube put it up there have the opportunity one day man getting a beer with with Peter Gabriel or, or <laughs> Eric Clapton at the Royal Albert Hall or, you know I was there yeah. recently and uh, it's amazing man That's, you are a very ambitious person but you're you already be, man. You're, you're already be. most of the way there you know you've done so much work and you've amassed like, such a collection and you've connected with so many artists. Yeah, and yeah. Here, here we are connecting as so human true. beings. It's absolutely, very, very absolutely. Cool. So it's uh, it's nice to be around inspired, enthusiastic people. Absolutely, man. Uh, uh, then in two or three, you did the a soundtrack uh, for a film called I think called Trace Off. How, yeah, how that was it? where uh, Nidhi Batmuli oh, sang on that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How did it happen? I mean, it's very common for 
people that do ambient or kind of electronic music to end up doing soundtrack. I mean, like Tangerine Dream, right? Tangerine have done. Oh I yeah, have, did like it's a great drama, example. You know, and uh, yeah, uh, for science fiction, horror movies, or whatever you know, they kind well, of. Well, and that's more... that's where I ended up going. But with trade offs, the director was here in San Diego, and he was yeah. filming here in San Diego. And he knew someone that knew me through my music or working at the music store or something like that, yeah. um, which I, I wasn't working there anymore. I was full time doing music for television, a lot of TV commercials. But yeah. he reached out and said, hey, would you want to score my film? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. Because um, the director was a fan of films that I had seen that I really liked, like uh, Kama Sutra, Monsoon Wedding. This is Miranar. Um, and so I was like, I would love to do music, deep, emotional, ambient music like this. So it was a, a very easy thing to do for me. And um, I did a lot of independent horror films because horror films are very textural and very dramatic and really fun because you get to go over the top, you know, you get to be suspenseful and then all this stuff is happening. Um, so I, I love music for film. I haven't done a lot recently the last film I did was quite a while ago for Lionsgate called Cold Storage, but I did a, a big score for that, and that was fun. Yeah. You. You, might, yeah. you, must, you must know the Rio Argento, right, in, in, the, in Italy. Uh, oh, what's, what's that? The Rio, the Rio Argento, of, of course, oh, no. with Tusperia, Tenebra, no, of course, you know, I would say. Oh, okay. Italy. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, many in Italy, they're, you know, soundtrack, right? Ennio Morricone is very popular. Oh, yeah. Yes. But there are many others that did, you know, suspend horror movies where, uh, the, I don't know, if you don't like, like if you don't like horror movies, they, you can take the music right, and listen to it. So I I always separate the two things, two different things, right? So I, do I. I listen to a lot of soundtrack music. Right. With the movie may be terrible, right? And But they, the soundtrack is great. And vice versa, you know, they I sing great movies where the soundtrack is bad, you know, in my <laughs> it's opinion. It's true. It's true. I, I do find a lot of parallels to the music I want to make and film music um, because the music that I am making, instrumental, dramatic, epic, ambient, but very thematic music doesn't exist anywhere else other than the genre I'm in and film. Yeah. Um, and so whether it's Hans Zimmer or James Newton Howard or Howard Shore or any of these guys, Edward Shearmer, you listen to this stuff by itself without the movie and it, the, what's happening in the mix, in the production, and the, the themes and the emotion that's in there is magic. And that inspires me more than uh, rock music or whatever, you know, any, any day. Man, I would love to interview all this <laughs> movie director, that, I mean, uh, you know, film composer that you mentioned because they're amazing. Unfortunately, you know, as you mentioned before, you know, this year, the last three, four weeks, we got a lot of great musicians, you know, Vangelis and the Klaus Schulze of this world and many other men. It's, it's, uh, it's not good, man. No. People, people like them, they don't come around. It's like Michael Jordan, right? They comes every 50 years, you know, they're not everybody. They're great musicians, great players, but, you know, the, the Michael we're, Jordan of this world is very different. You know? We're losing, so many legends have been taken in the last three months. And these are legendary musicians that inspired me, all of them, yeah. from this blossoming time of the late 70s, early 80s. All yeah. this great music is happening. You know, you talk about Klaus Scholz and Ben Jealous. Um, you know, these are foundational people, and Ben Jealous especially. I'm, I'm believing what me. I got. I mean, and, and the, my, some of my most favorite music of Ben Jealous is not Blade Runner. You know, it's like the, ba the Bounty. No, um, the kids, yeah. Oh, because the, the film score was never released, but I have a bootleg of the whole score. But that it's was a, a big, wonderful film, but so moody, so beautiful. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah I, I find the deeper scores a lot of these yeah. the artists, and uh, I get really inspired by that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. The guy was unbelievable. Before we talk about with uh, your your collaboration with John Jenkins. Yeah. So how you went there to, at the time, you released two albums, and you put that um, soundtrack together. Can you, how people get a hold of you from, you know, TV, from radio, from commercial, you know, to do, you know, 10, 20 second spot on a, for a car or 
whatever there are people selling on TV and whatever. How how they get a hold of you? How they you create well, like a library? Or well, I'm in San Diego. It? Yeah, San Diego is just south of Los, Los Angeles. Angeles. That's right. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of production in San Diego, a lot more than people think. And Ooh, yeah. yeah, and uh, I was doing music for Sony for the PlayStation division. I was doing oh, wow. a lot of the trailers. And I would have someone call me, hey, are you the guy that did the, the trailer for God of War 3 on PlayStation 2 or 3? And I'd be like, yeah. And they'd say, hey, do you do TV commercials? And I said, yeah. I just say yes to everything. <laughs> um, and, and then I would do a TV commercial and they'd say, hey, are you get the guy that did the TV commercial for that uh, Nespresso coffee thing? And I go, yeah. Hey, will you do this? Sure. Wherever the money is, you know, I got to buy more instruments so I can make records. <laughs> Um, so it's all word of mouth and people calling me because they saw or or heard something that I had created for for media, or they saw a film that I had done, and they said, "Hey, I saw I I heard your score for Cold Storage on Lionsgate. Would you do something similar for my film? Or I like the kind of ambient sounds you did. Can you do this commercial for this wellness product that's all soft and nice?" I'm like, "Yeah, yes, yes, yes." We don't we don't look at the numbers. Does TV uh, doing thirty seconds for a TV commercial or game? They they pay well comparatively. Or well, because I own two publishing companies, the key for making money as a composer is to get something on television. Um, if you have commercials on television and you own the publishing rights, every time that airs, you get a royalty. I got you. Um, and I started doing a lot of infomercials and infomercials are 30 minute long commercial. You know, sometimes late at night, you see the shark yeah, in the, the morning, theater. right? Yeah. The infomercials. So I started doing those and this is 30 minutes of music. It's almost like an album, but these infomercials play thousands of times in a month. And if I'm the publisher for this and the writer, I'm getting the writer's share of the royalties and the publisher's share. So music for television is where it's at as far as making a living um, right now, especially now that we live in a world where people don't pay for music. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you don't have to go to the store and, and spend $10, $12 for a CD. You just, you click a button and you listen to whatever you want. So I think musicians, if you're not touring, you either have to have a lot of streams or have some other source of income to fuel your music. Yeah. Um, luckily I've sort of transitioned into that where um, as a recording artist, my support from that has become very good. And I'm in a place where I'm, I'm seeing a future where I can just make records full time and then do some soundtrack work on the side. So it sort of shifted from, from working really hard for music for television and making records on the side. Now I just make records and I have some soundtrack work on the side. Right, so the, the good example would be Bad Camp. I think if Bad Camp, the musician get paid I think 90 cents of the dollar. So it's very, very, very good. The, yeah, the if you're selling percent, right? things, yeah. As opposed to Spotify, you need to have like a million hits a month to get a check for $20 or whatever. More, so. more than a million, yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know where the industry is going to go. The bottom line is, if the current paradigm for music consumption is not supporting the artist, the artists are either going to still make the music they want and release it independently, or the system is going to realize, hey, there's not a whole lot of good music coming out because there's not a lot of people that can make a living from it. And I think that's going to shift in the future. I think it's possible that there's going to be a global shift in consciousness of people as well. And I think in the future, it's possible that art will be much more highly regarded than it is right now, especially in the United States. All that matters is money. And as you and I know, money doesn't really exist and it doesn't make us happy and it's not why we're here. I think in the, in the, we, if we could be moving into a society where art and music is highly regarded um, and money is not such the focus and people are less selfish, I think we might see a big bloom in creativity coming like we saw in the late 70s, early 80s. But that's me being optimistic about the future, you know. For me, on the other hand, for me, Spotify is great because I pay 10 bucks a month or whatever that is, and I'm able to listen to your stuff last night because I don't yeah. know, I don't know any of your music or and thousands and thousands and thousands of other musicians. So 
for a marketing tool point of view is a, the best thing that I ever have, right? For you as the producer, as the owner of the ride, you get you get one cent every a thousand hits or whatever the amount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, that's the that's what's happening everywhere. Everything's going to subscription. Television is almost gone. Radio yeah. is almost gone. If you want to listen to music, you open an app on your phone or in your car or on your computer and you're on Spotify or Apple Music or Amazon MP3 or Tidal. If you want to watch a movie, you open your your TV and you're either on Netflix, Disney Plus, HBO Max, Discovery Plus, whatever. Everything is subscription based. So you pay $10 a month to like 10 different people. You pay $100, $100 a month to the world and you get to consume whatever you want, whenever you want. So it's like more, more, more. Yeah. But I don't think that's going to sustain forever, but we'll see. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, absolutely. For me, I was doing that before the pandemic. Uh, and I I needed to slow down and I was doing a lot of stuff that I didn't like and I wasn't, I was going too fast and I didn't have the time to think about it. And and like they say here, United States smell the roses, you know, so you need to sl slow down and then see, you know, what's important to you, or your family, what would you like to do, what the goals, eventually all will leave this planet or whatever. And then I love do what that. you like, do what you like and be happy with it and do something positive and important in the world. It's not just well, see, so, everything you, everything you just said is the concept of in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Right and there. we, are, we live in a very noisy world. Um, everywhere you go is noise oh. um, in, in the media, on television, in movies, the radio, the internet is full of noise. Um, and we're not meant to be constantly bombarded by colors and images and sounds. And we're Absolutely. not, we're not quite ready for it. And it's, it's causing damage, I think, to, to some people. So for me, what you said is absolutely true. I thrive on silence, space, yeah. connecting with people I love, focusing on one single thing and not hearing anything else. Absolutely. And one sound, just the piano, respond to it, um, quiet time, breathing. Um, and I put all of that into this album because the concept of this album is about going in to tiny places and realizing that you don't need all the noise. All you need is this one little thing that you think is beautiful and you could focus on that. And in that small thing is a universe of inspiration. Um, and the cool thing is so far, um, everyone that is sending me messages, hundreds of people are loving this album and they're putting on their headphones and putting their phones down oh. and not multitasking and they're experiencing the music and they're getting lost in it. And I think that is the best compliment I could ever uh, get. Uh, absolutely. Later on, we'll talk about the, the album in, but I will add the end. I will add now in the sense that. People don't live the now. People live in the past. Man, I, I wish I had done that. You know, why I did did that? On the talking about the future, man, I would I would love to do this. I would love to do that. Why I didn't do that? Just live the present. People don't live in the present, man. I yeah. that's my my take on that. You know, you yeah. nailed it right there. Most people are thinking of the future. Someday when I retire, I could travel and see the world. Someday when I'm not so busy, I could learn how to play guitar. Someday I can go visit Hawaii. Someday I can do this. Or, you know, I'm doing this right now, but I, I don't want to be doing this right now. I want to be doing something else. So, so many people are driving around in their car, but they're not even in the car. They're in their mind somewhere else, somewhere else uh, where they want to be, and they're not being present. And not only not being present for those around them, they're not being present for themselves. Um, and uh, it's okay to have goals and ambitions and to look to the future. But that future doesn't exist. It hasn't happened. It's not going to happen how you think it is. And the past is gone. All we have, you and me, Claudio and David, right now right at 9.57 a.m., this is all we have. Absolutely, man. Yeah. The next minute hasn't happened. And the last minute, we can never get back. So I, I think just knowing that and realizing that each moment is a gift and in each moment is unbelievable magic that I think you can sit really well with yourself and be content and happy and love where you are. Um, that's a powerful notion. Um, and it's difficult for people, especially Americans. 
say something in psychological terms. People, maybe they don't love one another. I, I don't know. We, I don't know. People, we, we live in a crazy world, man. It's, yes, I agree. No. But it's a crazy world full of magic and wonderful things. It's a crazy world full of horrors. Um, it's what you choose to focus on and embrace that makes who you are and, and how you walk through your day and your life and, and the people you interact with and the art that you make. Yeah. Like you, you're sharing your love for music with all these people. You're choosing to find magic and share it with the world. And there's so many people looking for what you are doing. And it's a lot, of, like you say, you 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 produce your music for yourself, but yep. finally for everybody, right? So mm -hmm. it, you you gotta do what you like, and if you can contribute to the world, I'm like you mentioned before, right? I'm the type of person. One day I'm going to be 86, whatever, and I wanna look back in my life, man. I did exactly what I wanna do. I saw yeah. a thousand of Joe. I got yep. a beer with Peter Gabriel at three o'clock <laughs> in the morning, a club in London, or any club, or whatever it can be. I, I don't. I don't want to wait for or make time for. No, I'm. I'm. I'm doing it. I'm. You got I, it. I do what I like. I do what I like, and I will continue. That's what I study. I. I. I thought at the time. Well, I have expensive. My wife would say I have expensive taste because I spend a lot of money in music and concerts. So yeah, I study a lot. So now I can afford to do whatever I want. Fly to you know four times a year, and I was at the. I saw the last three shows in of, uh, Genesis. In London, a couple months ago, I last month I went to see Eric Clapton at the Royal. Wow! Army. See, you're living. Of course, right you now. gotta do that. And, and when you're at the concert, in every note of every song, that's where you are, and yeah. it, it fills you up. And I feel like you do. And and in my big yeah. album, people yeah. kept asking me why it takes so long. Why is it so big? Why is every song so rich? And I said that I want to make this like it's my last album. Absolutely, man. If I'm not here tomorrow, I'm gonna be like. I made eight records and I made the most amazing music and I put it out in the world and all hundreds of, well, thousands of people are having their lives changed because of my music. Absolutely. Good. I'm good. Feel, yeah, feel free to elaborate your collaboration with John Jenkins. I think you did uh, three albums with him. Trilogy, yeah. Yeah, Tre Treasure, Beyond Words and The Crossing and Found. And uh, I didn't know him that well. And uh, so I ended up listening to the music and you know, uh, John Jenkins by himself, right? And then I saw the album. I no, I saw. I, I listened to the album that you guys did together, mm -hmm. different tracks. And I, it, it, it's a, it was a very good compliment. I mean, I, I it's, it, it works well to do you. You know, I because I listened yeah. to your stuff by yourself, by yourself, John's stuff by himself, and then the two together. I, I, I see the influence, and it, it, it came up. Very good to go. How you end up meeting the guy and uh, Thank how, you. how well, did it work out? Yeah. Well, when when uh when I got signed to the record label, yeah. he was already part of the record label, and so and in uh in the early not or in the late nineties, yeah. the record label had a headquarters at a house here near the beach, and all the artists were there, and they have desks set up and people on the phones, and they're a record label, but the artists would go there, and they had a recording studio at the record label. So I met John Jenkins. I listened to his music and I had immediate connection with, with John Jenkins as far as the sounds that we both like. Um, and then we were asked to score a film together. A filmmaker in Los Angeles was a fan of John Jenkins and a fan of David Helpling in 99, I think, or, or 2000. And he said, I want you guys to, to score my film, but you have to do it together in the same room. And this guy's name was Chris Cummings. So he hired us to score his film, but he said the only way you do it is if we did it together. So I sat next to John Jenkins in the studio in Encinitas and we scored this film and it was explosive because I have all these ideas. He has all these ideas, but we're both very, um, we have no ego and we're not trying to, we're just like, hey, let's make it together. And everything he liked, I liked. Everything I liked, he liked. So during this film scoring process, we created all this music that was way too amazing for the movie. So we put it aside, we finished the movie and all that music ended up becoming Treasure, which is our first album together. Yeah. Um, and then that was a huge success. Treasure, you know, David Helpling, John Jenkins, Treasure was this big thing. So then it became time for another sophomore album. They're like, okay, you guys have to make a, a sequel together. So then we did The Crossing, which ended up being I think of the trilogy, the crossing is the big one. 
And then we did found, which is also really huge. And making those three records was the most effortless experience I've had making music. Because if I'm having an off day, or if I come up with a phrase or something, and I don't know if it's good enough, there's someone else to say, hey, that is good. Just just record it, put it in there. I can, I can work with that and then... You know. Yeah, when I'm by myself I, and within, I spend a lot of time wondering, uh, is this good enough? I don't know, this is, it could be better. And you get in a spiral of, of self-doubt. And that, that's why I had to put the record away because I was way too close to it. I couldn't see what it really was. I had to get away, come back and go, oh my goodness, it's beautiful. Why are you being so critical? Just let the music be amazing. And uh, it, that is the gift of collaboration is having that someone next to you to tell you that what you're doing is great. Um, so yeah, those three records were effortless to make. Absolutely, man. So what, what do you think your, your inspiration to create sounds, which is totally your own, as if you're making, you're making music without compromise, if, if you will, come together. We're, so it's it very easy to, in, 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 we will talk about that in a minute. It was, would have been very easy for you to give up, uh, do commercial work, is easy money, or do another soundtrack, is, you know, easier. But that was a project that you needed to finish. I'm, I'm not finishing this one or six months from now. It take me two years, but eventually you, you, you finish it. Where, where you, where you think of the inspiration come from to keep on working hard, to wake up in the morning and, and you say, well, today I'm not going to work in that album, but you wake up the next day and say, man, okay, I want, I have an idea over my dreams or whatever. It's a beautiful day, whatever. I want to work with stuff. You know, where, where, where is the motivation, the inspiration of, as an artist in many ways come from, you know? I think that's the good question. I think it is two things. I think motivation and inspiration are opposite sides of a coin. I can be inspired to do something, but to step out and do it takes yeah. the motivation. And my inspiration comes from everything. I'm always inspired. Never do I not have an idea. Never do I sit down and I'm bored. Never do I sit down at the piano or a synthesizer and guitar and I don't like what's happening. I have a, millions of ideas and I have grand visions, but you have to be really motivated to take these little ideas that might be 30 seconds long and turn them into a symphony. That takes a lot of work for me, years of work. So the motivation for me is just the goal of saying, I'm gonna create this great grand opus of an album and I'm going to release it. I don't know when, and the years kept going by and I kept working on it, working on it, but I, was, I knew I was just gonna do it because I'm the kind of person that if I say I'm going to do something, I do it. And my friends, all my friends know, they're like, hey, how's the album coming along? You've been working on it for a long time. And I would play them bits of it. And they're like, oh my gosh, this is the best music I've ever heard. You have to finish your album. So having my wife be very supportive and my friends be very supportive lets me know that I'm on the right track. Because I think if I was just in here with the door closed all the time, I wouldn't have those people cheering me on and telling me that it is a great work. So yeah, it, well, yeah. it's all, all of those things keeps me going. Instead of you finding music, perhaps the other way around, perhaps music found you in life. True. You True. Well, um, I don't read music at all. Um, I, I taught myself how to play guitar. I taught myself how to play piano. I taught myself how to program and play synthesizers. I taught myself how to play drums, how to be a recording engineer. It's taken a long time, uh, you know, 22 years or whatever. But um, I, I think that now that I'm here, um, when I play an instrument, I'm not thinking, if I'm in a flow state, I'm not thinking, play this chord. I put my hands down and I hear something and my hands start moving and I go, oh, and I hear the next part coming in. Do this, do this. It's almost like the music is just going, shoo, threw me into the instrument. I'm not conjuring it in my mind. It's coming from my heart, you know, it's just flowing out. Um, and then later on, when it's time to produce the song, I can get a little cerebral about it. But when yeah. I'm writing, it comes from from my core, you know, I, I'm. it's just flowing out. And I just record everything, record everything, and then later figure out all the best stuff and put it together. I got you. That's why I was able to listen to I think a seven or eight albums and uh, it just some tracks if you remember that for me were important uh 
it I connected with them if you remember if not, but the Sun Racer from the album called Found. Yeah, we're how pieced it together if you remember. Yeah, Sunracer. Yeah. Sunracer's a big one. That's my favorite song from Found, which was my the third album in the trilogy with John right. Jenkins. Yeah. 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 Thank you. That was fun. Beautiful. That was a fun one to make. The other one is called Above Hole from the album called The Crossing. Yeah, Above All. That's a very simple song that, that started with those two synthesizer chords and then it just grew with guitars and other sounds and and that was john jenkins and i sitting together that song above all um john jenkins had a phone call and he was on the phone and i played two chords and he goes what did you just play and i go i don't know he goes record that that's where the song came from wow if he wasn't here i would have played those two chords and never thought that's about right. it that's right well, yeah synchronicity <laughs> synchronicity yep. right there mm -hmm. but on the, the this burning sky from the album colleen oh, man what a what a bastard piece it is man you don't thank know how you. good that song is man thank you that uh that was a big one on in and that would that took a lot of work it started with the guitar riff yeah i was playing this riff and i was like i heard in the riff the sadness but also anger and a little exotic like eastern so I said, I'm going to put in, I played a bunch of drums and I wanted uh, Nitty to come into vocals. And then yeah. I had this grand story with the verse, the chorus and the bridge, and then this big epic part. And it turned into almost like a, a soundtrack for something that doesn't exist, you know? So it's, it's really cool that you connect with that song. Beautiful. But let's, let's concentrate on that album. And uh, we, we already know where the, the, the meaning behind the, the title of the album, but uh, and you play with so many vocals and uh, uh, vocalists there. It's uh, playing all the instrument. That's that's a bastard piece, man. No wonder that it took whatever eight years. <laughs> and yeah. you, you, it's no Ray, it's no Ray, and eventually you say no, it's Ray. I can release it to to the world, and uh, that's that's a beautiful album, man. Thank you. It's really cool to hear you say that, and that you listen to it and you 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 recognize the it's, it's, what is what is there. That's very. I'm what have been the, the reception of the public or people on the spot the bakery or the people that you send the music to or i'm quite sure you have had great reception from the public right so, yeah well it's it's been out it was it was released on april 15th so yeah. what's it been seven weeks six weeks hasn't even been two months yet but everyone is loving it everyone's freaking out i'm getting hundreds of messages on my email yeah. instagram twitter facebook and my youtube channel you know, you, you see a, a, cha a video on YouTube and it has like 50,000 views, but it has like no comments. I'll have like 10,000 views and 100 comments and every comment is gushing like, you changed my life, this song made me cry, boom, boom, boom. So wow, that, that's how I know it's good music is because yeah. people are getting emotional and they're reaching out and messaging me. So I'm I'm already like, the, the album is already way successful for me no matter what. The numbers are doesn't matter uh, i want to i want to give you the, the title for your next album if you like <laughs> uh, if you like in uh, you know we can do something like now or now you know in, in, inside out or outside in or whatever you know okay we, all right I don't, <laughs> from i'll take the, it <laughs> from the outside world to in man yeah and, yeah uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a lot of new projects right now but i'm spending most of my time promoting and supporting in because because it's it's the big album and i want to make sure i put as much support behind it as i can um doing interviews with people like you making music videos interacting with people on social media yeah because um, that's the that's how people hear about it and I, I want this album in to reach as many new ears as i can and the cool thing for me is because i have this is my eighth studio album i have a lot of listeners that have been following me for 20 years they all love this album, but then I'm getting new listeners that are younger because, you know, my listeners from the past are probably my age, you know, not young, um, but I'm getting these, these younger listeners that are discovering this music and they don't even understand what kind of music is this. Yeah. I don't have an answer for you. I don't know what kind of music it is either. It's David Helpling music. And if you like it, cool. But um, I think because of the way music is now, all the new music, I think music like this is being embraced and discovered by young people. And Absolutely. that, that is amazing because yep. it's a whole nother generational shift 
of people that are discovering what used to be called new age or electronic or alternative or whatever. Yeah. They're, they're eating it up. They love this stuff. Absolutely, man. I, I, I also, uh, the, some of the messages that I read from, from the videos and um, on some of the tracks and YouTube last night, you know, people get very emotional and stuff. You know, I don't know. I want to make something up. You know, I was going to a uh, breakup with my boyfriend or my mom is dying out of cancer. Yep. Or, yep. Or, or whenever I break up with my dad or this, or I lost my job. And, and people really resonate with that stuff. I mean, it's like they take it personal. I mean, they, your music inspired me to do this. Your music inspired me, you know, helping out, taking care of my old sibling or whatever. Yeah, there are many, many, many stories. And, you know, you look at one of the YouTube videos and there's like a hundred comments and each comment, a, a lot of them are like this, you know, I was driving from up to the mountains and I heard this song and I had a religious experience and awakening really or good. I just lost my father. And this, this song, particular song really helped me through that or, you know, whatever, but it's almost like this album is therapy for some people. Um, and, and I take that as a compliment. Absolutely. You know, I didn't make the music to have any agenda, but the, each song has a lot of emotion and each song has a lot of, of resonant energy in it. And it's cool that people are connecting with that, whether it's on headphones or big speakers, it's, it's vibrating them and they're feeling something. That's I'm sure you. You must get emotion when you when you read the comment and the stuff that you know yes. they're very personal comments. You know, I was, you know, I've been diagnosed of cancer, whatever, and, and, and that your music helped me out, or helped my mom out, or whatever. Yeah, I do get really emotional. I'm an absolutely, I'm an emotional absolutely. mess most of the time. I'm right on the edge most of the time with with yeah. everything, um, and because I'm a very emotional person and I'm very um, empathetic with people. It, it becomes difficult not to get emotional um, engaging with a listener who is having a very um, profound experience with the music. Absolutely, man. Um, so I, I, it's it's difficult, but I think in this world, like we talked about right now is all we have, when you're having an authentic interaction with someone, whether it's an artist and a listener, or it's just two people, you gotta, you gotta give yourself to that and, and if, if it makes you cry, if it makes you get emotional, let it go. That's why we're, we're here get into that. Let yourself cry, connect with that person, be authentic. Because like we said, we only have right now, we, tomorrow is not promised to anyone. So, so why not dive in deep? You, you go to, you know, since I go to many concerts, people are on the phone recording every 20 seconds, half an hour. What are you doing that? You're paying good money to see a good, enjoy the moment. You should, what are you doing? Just took a step. Yeah, and then you're going to go back and watch it on your phone and you have this tiny fraction of what the experience was like. That's right. You yeah. were there in the ultimate surround sound. That's right, yeah. And not only that, you're experiencing pulsating music with thousands of other souls that are happy and positive. It's like live music creates like this vortex of energy of all these people getting emotional. It depends on the music. But um, to just be there in that experience and feel it, the, the memory and the experience of that is way more colorful Absolutely, man. than this tiny little movie. So I, I, I agree with you there. You know, absolutely, man. Uh, I, I saw the, the four uh, videos uh, that you sent me, oh. and they're very, very well done, very well put together. That's a beautiful piece of art, especially the bending toward the night. Yeah. I mean, feel free to elaborate. How the, I mean, I was blown away. How the stuff, who, who were doing those stuff? How the, what's the process of making one? Well, and it's well, when I, I, I told you when I was making this album, I knew it was a big one. This yeah. was the big album, the, the grand opus, whatever. And if there was ever, I've done, I've hired people to do music videos before, yeah. but I knew that when we have an album that's got eight anthems on it, I want to get some videos created. And I'm connected with some artists and, yeah. um, Let's talk about bending towards the night because yeah. that got released yesterday or the day before. The day before. Um, the artist, his name is Forrest Rain. And um, Forrest Rain did a music video for a song called The Heart of Us from my last album, Rune, which was ambient guitar. So back in December, this album was finished and it was going off to mastering in New York. And I reached out to Forrest and I said, hey, I've got this new album coming out. 
are you interested in a music video? And he said, yes, send me the whole album. So I sent him the whole album unmastered. And I said, you tell me what song it moves you that you want to make a video for. And of all the songs, he said, I want to do Bending Towards the Night. And I go, you realize it's the longest song on the album, right? It's eight and a half minutes. That's a lot of work. He said, I don't care. I love this song. This is what I want to do. And he said, what is this song about for you? And I said, well, when I think about this song, it starts off very sultry, sexy. It's alluring. It's mysterious. And then it becomes more exciting and interactive and it builds and builds to a climax. And I said, it feels like, you know, two beings having intimacy or coming together. And I, I said, there's a lot of love in there but I want you to do whatever you want. So he goes, okay, I have an idea. I'll get back to you. So he came back to me with a full storyboard of the whole video of this uh, visitor going to this planet and the, and the planet is making the music and it's resonating with the music. And there's this being that's like a celestial being that's part of the planet and, and draws him in. And I was like, what? Wow. I said, go ahead. So he worked on that for like four months. Um, and, he, he would send me concepts and rough images and I was just loving it all. Um, so yeah, that's, it's only been out for 48 hours and people are loving it. So that's cool. You mentioned before that you don't no plan to play live. Why not? I mean, there are many kind of, you know, people that do it, your stuff is not electronic, you know, but that why, why not play like a, a, a live, gig you know every so often and once a month or whatever you know. that's a great question and there's two there's two challenges there for me number one i have pretty serious stage fright um being on stage i don't know if i'm gonna mess up and and i've been that way since i was really small i'm not comfortable in large groups of people i'm not good at public speaking um i just want to make records and be in here you know um and so it's difficult to play live for me, but I've done it before and it is really rewarding to have an audience in immediately respond. But my kind of music, I'm either going to play with a large ensemble of, of artists to try to replicate all the stuff in the record, or I'm gonna have to play to like backing tracks yeah. synchronized, you know? And I don't know how I feel about, I think if I wanna go witness someone perform live music, I like to see them playing the music, not just all the song is playing in the background and they're playing one instrument. So yeah. I think if, if I'm gonna play live, especially the music of In, I would need, God, maybe five other people. And I think we can maybe make it happen. Be really nice to have a string octet behind us too. So, well, we, we would need uh, the record label to fund a, a, a gig, we, a tour we could put together. And I, I would do that, but I would need, some really good musicians and some months to practice, you know? Um, yeah. So if, I'm not saying no, but um, I'd much rather just keep making records, you know? And, and if it happens to be doing a, doing some live gigs and, you know, record that, um, maybe sell the CD or whatever, you know? It's, uh... Well, that, that would be definitely something would have to be done. If we had a really big ensemble to perform music from in, um, and we would want to record it and have you know 4k video and do like a concert blu-ray or something yeah absolutely if, if we did it i would want to really do it yeah so it, and it can be a good source of income i mean i see so many shows uh, you know this every every week or so and every year that you know people at the end of the show whether it's a big big name or big venue or famous people or, or up and coming artists they can sell CD, they can sell t-shirt, a brochure. They like I, to take picture with the, with the guys like me and at the end, you know. I agree, yeah, I, I think it's performance. Money, a little bit of money to be made there as well. No, Sorry. there's a lot of money to be made. Um, for an artist like me who makes a record and then it's out there streaming, um, and this is also on vinyl. So I have a lot of people ordering the vinyl, a lot of people ordering double CD through the yeah. record label. Um, that's one thing, but if I was to play live and get a lot of people to come to the shows that income would be 10 times what the streaming income is but um it's like i said it would take a significant amount of work to build an ensemble um to really perform this stuff live and have it really be huge because this is a huge record i want people to go to the show and have it sound 100 feet tall you know so it would take a considerable amount of work 
But ambient music, instrumental electronic music is becoming very popular. Like there are young people going to ambient gigs in LA, these ambient church gigs. Steve Roach is doing some amazing live performances. So maybe we're going into a place where people will start going to shows like this and having, you know, like in the eighties, we went to the Pink Floyd laser show. That's right. Yeah. In the theater and all, of the, all, everyone would go and smoke some weed and watch Pink Floyd and the lasers. And it was an experiential thing. So I think these new ambient concerts that are happening with projected visuals and, you know, even if it's one guy with synthesizers, hundreds of people are going there and having like a Absolutely. three hour experience. I think I would really like to play a gig to people that appreciate that kind of experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Robert, you mentioned Steve Roach, he did a gig last night at- uh, In New York, church, I think. In a church in New York. And, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I wanted to see if somebody recorded that because he's very good. I, hopefully, I will be able to get a hold of him and uh, an interview. It's another great musician in Northern California. I don't know if you know him, but Robert Rich. Yeah. Yeah. Robert Rich has worked with Steve Roach and Robert Rich has been in connection with Spotted Packery, the record label I'm on. Right. It's about when, when the guy that I mentioned that I was going to be see a guy in, in, yeah. in Monterey, I'm going to see his house. And then, yeah. And Robert there. Rich. He's really he's a cool. very nice person to me. Yeah. John Jenkins has spent time with him and he talked to me. So Steve Roach is a really nice guy. Yeah. I played a concert for my first album between green and blue. And I opened for Steve Roach in a, a big, uh, it's like a, a IMAX dome theater. And we played a concert. Yeah. Steve Roach is a very nice guy, very prolific, but he's paving the way right now by doing these big ambient concerts. Yeah, and I absolutely. think if, if he can keep doing this and inspire others, people like me, if I can get an ensemble together, I would love to do a live performance. Um, but you know, he's in Tucson. He's, He's really connected with Spotted Peckery. So if you want to talk to Steve Roach, I'm sure he'd love to do an interview with you. Yeah, really yeah I need to get a hold of the guy. I think I emailed him. A, a really of, nice guy. Really, um, yeah. Email him and say, hey, I was talking to David Helpling, and he said you would do an interview with me and see what yeah. he says. Okay, I won't do that. If not, you can put an interaction. And, uh... he's, in a, he's an amazing guy, and he's inspiring everyone in, in ambient electronic music. Mm. He's at the top, he's in my opinion. He's, um, he's, he's very good, yeah. And he's very kind and, you know, he's never going to stop. And that's my kind of energy. So, Absolutely, yeah. man. Man, I, I think uh, In, if you can agree with me, it's your best album you've ever done. Uh, is possible to do top that? That's a big question. <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think now I'm moving into a space as a person, as a being, where um, I all of the challenges and conflict that it took to create in has taught me so much about myself and what to do and what not to do. I think I'm moving into a place where I could create big, beautiful, emotional music and not take so long to do it. Um, so that said, I do believe that in is my best work. I think it's the big album. Um, I don't know that I would attempt to make another double album like in ever because it was exhausting. Um, but the rewards that are, that I'm seeing right now are amazing. I mean, people are, their lives are changing and it's only been six weeks. Um, so every album I make from here on out, I'm going to put everything I have into it and make it sound like my dreams. And if people like that, cool. Um, I'm never going to stop. But I don't know if I'm going to try to make something as big as in again. I, I might need some time to uh, to breathe a little bit. <laughs> you know? No, normally it's an album that took, I don't know, eight years to make or whatever, or it's a double album, but it, it took, it's an emotional toll on you. Oh. I mean, you know, people, if you're doing right. pop, you're doing rock, you write great lyrics, you hire a bunch of great musicians, you rock and you see, you can do an album in a year, but in your case, you need to go inside in, like you go inside your soul, man, and open up to the world with your emotion, frustration, you know, crazy parent you have, or great parent you ever have, or your friends, or you were bullied at school, and where you have a little bit of HTSD, or this, and Asperger, whatever, and, and open up open up inside. And, and You're exactly right. It, it takes a lot for me, yeah. I, I know that everyone's different, but for me, the music is very personal. 
Absolutely, man. The music is very solitary. It's it it is created from myself, um, and you have I have to be very vulnerable Absolutely. to let the music flow. So yeah, I I think what you're talking about right now is at the core of why it took so long to finish yeah, because yeah. it was overwhelming. It was not o it was not only overwhelming technically, which it certainly was, but yeah. it was overwhelming emotionally. You know, you have one song like This Burning Sky, which yeah. is this tragic cinematic story that's very emotional. And it's got like a hundred tracks of audio. Um, finishing that one was so hard. Um, and I wanted to, I had, I had already put in so much time, it had to be the best version of itself. Um, so yeah, emotionally it is really hard. Technically it's really hard, but I did it and I think it's my best work. And now everyone gets to experience everything I went through. Absolutely. You know, no. Absolutely. Look, looking back at your musical career, it, it, what, what moment are special to you? Any, any regret, anything that perhaps you would have done differently now you look back? It's very easy to, to connect the dog looking backwards. It's very difficult to put it, connect the dog going forward, right? So anything yeah. you would um, have done differently? Or? My, my, my gut reaction is no. Um, as we talked about living in the moment and doing your best work, I think when I made the other records, those are a snapshot of where I was at the time as a person emotionally um, in my love life as a father in the United States, which is not always easy to, to watch the news. Um, so all of that goes into each record. You know, you're influenced by so many things. Um, so I don't know that I have any regrets, but every time I listen to one of my older records, I, I have grown so much as an engineer and I've grown so much as a composer that I'm like, oh, I, I shouldn't have done that or I should have done that differently or I should have used a different sound. I think every artist has that when they go back. They go, oh, I wish that I would have done this better. But, but you, we all have to pat yourself on the back and say, hey, back in 2003, that's where you were. You did a good job. It's okay. Now you're here. So I don't have any regrets at all. But of course, my technical mind would like to go back and make those records sound better. But that's not, you know, no, not going to no. happen. Think, think about the following. Um, you know, now you can tell your parents when they say, okay, give the music a try. If no, it doesn't work. You can always go back to school. You're 18 years old. Look at you now, man, where you are, man. Crazy. That, that's, that's the best decision you ever man. Yeah, thing. yeah. And it, it is weird to go back and think, you know, you know, because I, I graduated in 1987 from high school. Yeah. Um, and that was the moment I decided to do music and not anything else. And here I am in 2022, uh, full-time recording artist, composer, living in, in San Diego. Place, yeah. How did this happen? I don't even know. It's cosmic. You know, why am, why am I so blessed? I don't know. Um, but I'm super thankful to be here right now, today, and have a space where I can safely and comfortably express myself and make records. And I have a record label that wants to release my music. Absolutely. And I have people like you that want to talk about it. Absolutely. Um, right. So I am super stoked just to be here right now. Thankful yeah. every day. And the last question I have, feel free to yeah. mention your website, what's coming up from you, where oh. people can buy your music and... Yeah, well, my website is davidhelpling.com. And it's H E L P L I N G. And there's only one David Helpling in the world. So it's easy on Spotify and everywhere. There's only one of me. Um, if you go to David Helpling Official, that's my YouTube channel, yep. where there's uh, four music videos from In. And the last one, like we said, just premiered. So no more videos coming um, for this album that I know of. Um, but that's a place to experience a lot of my music in visual form. Some of the videos are 4K. So if you can go big screen and turn up your subwoofer, yeah. you can have an yeah. experience. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to um, buy any of my music, especially in on CD, double CD, double vinyl, or download the 2496 Studio Master, you can go to ambientelectronic.com. Ambientelectronic.com is the home of the record label, Spotted Peckery Music. Yeah. And you, can, you can order the CD, the vinyl, downloads. You can request signature, whatever. You can find all my music there. If you stream music, wherever you stream music, I'm there. Go go listen to it. Good for you, man. One thing we didn't talk about, In is my first album that has been completely mixed in Dolby Atmos surround. 
Um, it was mixed from all the original stems by John Kellogg in Los Angeles. So if you go to Apple Music and you yep. have an Atmos compatible theater or you have an Atmos compatible soundbar or the Apple AirPod Pro Atmos things, you can listen to the music and it is not the same mix as the record at all. Completely different experience. Um, and you could also have that spatial experience on a Tidal, T-I-D-A-L, yeah. and Amazon. They all have immersive, the immersive mixes of the album also available. So first time I've done that and I sat in a theater and listened to it and it is, there's stuff moving stuff everywhere. You really go inside the mix. It's really incredible. So we need, well, good question. I need to try that out, man. Yeah. 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 If well, you have any way to experience Atmos music, you can stream it from those three places, Apple title and Amazon and have that experience right now. So that's pretty cool. Unbelievable. Man. Unbelievable. Yeah. Man, it was very nice to be more than an interview with a musical conversation about two guys never met before, you know, be a Zoom, uh, yeah. I mean, close to the sea, you're in, in San Diego. It was, it was very nice talking to you, David, man. Keep on going, keep on doing what you're doing. Yeah, uh, it's, um, it's really nice to meet you. You're very kind. You're very inspired. Thank you um, much, man. Yeah. Uh, my publicist, Beth, she said, you got to do an interview with this guy. I love his interviews, and now I see why. Yeah, thank um, you very much. Yeah, so it's no, very no. nice to meet you. And if you're in town, give me yeah, a shout. We'll, we'll try to, I will send you an email. We'll try to uh, make it happen in San Diego. And uh, it's such a pleasure to me that at the beginning, I was very concerned about my accent or because ah. I was born in this country, you know, people wouldn't understand my question, but it's getting better. And I'm kind of refining my, my craft, so to speak. And uh, it's a be... very, very nice pleasure talking to you. Yeah, it's been great talking to you. Be proud of your heritage. You're from Chile. You. That's huge. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And stay inspired. Keep going to all your concerts. Keep making your radio stations. Keep interviewing people. And uh, thank you for sharing my music with all of your listeners. It's very, very cool. And I'm super grateful. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, man. Take it okay. easy, David. All right. Bye.